of the technicians die, they underestimated the strength of it. This, I call it a barometric bomb. This barometric bomb, according to Michael, was what was in the car, not a fertilizer bomb. I have an Oklahoma City report on that. So what did I do as an investigator? Well, I went to the Piccaninny Arsenal in New Jersey, and I gave them the contract number, which I obtained through a science magazine. One of my associates actually did the research on that. And I gave the Picatinny Arsenal the contract number. This is public, uh, uh, available to the public, by the way. And the Picatinny Arsenal came back and said, there's no such contract here, even though I had the contract number. By the way, that's documented in my report. And I went to Dinah Nobel, who I knew manufactured it. And they didn't even bother to respond. It's interesting to note that a Dinah Nobel expert witness testified at the grand jury when they indicted McVeigh. In September of 1995, some five or six months after the 19th of April, 1995, Oklahoma City, in September, there was a, I lost my trend of thought there for a minute. Oh, there was an article in Fireman's Magazine. It was written by the editor of Fireman's Magazine. The information was obtained from the Oklahoma City Fire Department. And in that article, again, that's in my report, in that article, it states, that four unexploded devices were taken out of the building. When people were in the building after the bombing, dying, they discontinued the rescue efforts for some five hours while they carried out a bunch of government files, men in blue suits of some sort, sweatsuits. So what I'm telling you is, Oklahoma City, was perpetrated by certainly people other than McVeigh and Nichols. And now Roger Moore, if you read the paper recently, the gun dealer who claims that he was robbed of his guns in Arkansas and that that money was used to finance the Oklahoma City bombing. Roger Moore has been accused by Terry Nichols of being involved in it. Roger Moore denies it. Roger Moore, at the time of the Oklahoma City bombing, was an FBI informant. I had an inside investigator in Oklahoma City tell me that there were at least 11 other individuals involved in Oklahoma City. Okay, that brings us up. We've gone through Pearl Harbor, Waco, Ruby Ridge, car bombing 93, Oklahoma City 95. That brings us up to 911. As I said, Michael's in prison. I'm his, quote, investigator of record, which means I'm like an attorney. I should have access to him on a regular basis. I represent this man. For a year prior to 911, actually a year and a half, I tried to get in and see Michael. He was in prison in Northern Pennsylvania. I was in the Philadelphia area. The Bureau of Prisons would not allow me to see him. I finally was able to talk to Michael in January 2003. I flew to the East Coast, spent three days with him. Michael told me that he had developed information from among his contacts in advance of 911 that they were going involved in using missiles, airplane missiles, and they were going involved in skyjackings. They were training Arab terrorists, and also he knew the identity of the person in the United States, an Arab who lived in Patterson, New Jersey, who was the leader of terrorist activity by the Arabs in this country. Now, Michael had this information because you're saying, how can Michael develop this information being in prison? 
because I met with Osama bin Laden, along with Michael, and along with the State Department representative in the spring of 1986. At that time, I was contacted by former top Reagan, Ronnie Reagan official, who said, can we help the Afghan rebels? They were our friends then. And I called Michael, I said, what do you think? And he said, let's meet. So there was a fourth fellow there. We, we didn't know at the time it was Osama bin Laden. He actually used the name Tim Osman, traveling under Turkish passport. But because of Michael, I passed the ball to him. I just arranged for the meeting and went on. But Michael traveled all over the world putting this package together to furnish the Afghan rebels with the surface air missiles that defeated the Soviets, really, shot down their helicopters. As a result of this, Michael developed sources inside the Arab world. And that's how Michael knew in advance about 9-1-1. Michael told the FBI on March the 20th, 2001, about this plan to use skyjack, skyjack airplanes and use them as missiles. He also furnished to the FBI one of his sources, one of his confidential sources inside the Arab group. The FBI interviewed him, threatened him with prosecution, and deported him. That man, along with his family, have disappeared. We think that they're dead. The FBI refused, absolutely refused, to look into this situation. More shocking is that Michael had the names of the people who were obtaining the false names of the people, the Arabs who were obtaining false passports, had their names. He had the source who could furnish him that information. He told FBI agent Keith Kutry, March 20th, 1990, 2001, excuse me. He told Kutry, he says, I'll give you these names, the name of this person, was coordinating the whole project for the Arabs, providing I be given immunity and he be given immunity. Mr. Kutry, in spite of the fact he was armed with this information six months prior to 911, came back two days after 911 on the 13th and saw Michael in prison again. Accused Michael of being anti government. NIFBI, a, B, a, a publicity seeker, and so forth, being disloyal. And so Michael, of course, didn't have much to say after that. Michael's still in prison, as I said. But we had this information, the FBI had this information, did nothing with it. <clears throat> Kutry admitted on March the third, on September the 13th, admitted that the FBI did nothing with it. So after I visited Michael, <clears throat> excuse me, 2003, I felt it was important that I confirm that the FBI did meet with him. The Bureau of Prisons would not furnish Michael with the, uh, the uh, visitors list to confirm it. And so I started writing letters to the FBI through Senator uh, George Allen. Oh, thank you, thank you and to confirm that he did in fact meet with them. I wanted to document it. I also asked for the identity of the other agent who was with Agent Kutry, and um, I had a terrible talk. It took me a year and a half writing letters to the FBI to get them to admit that they'd interviewed Michael on March the 20th, 2001. I finally did have that information. That information is available again in one of my reports, my uh, terrorism report that I have in the bag. So that basically brings me up to the present time. I think my time is up. But I, I feel compelled as a former FBI agent, I had all this training, and I feel compelled to do everything I can to educate as many uh, fellow Americans as I can as to what's going on behind the scenes. We have being operated and orchestrated primarily by U.S. military intelligence, covert criminal enterprise, 
involving the FBI and the CIA active in this country today. It's being covered up right from the beginning. They're using FBI informants to set up and frame people. By the way, they tried to frame me on a drug deal back in 1984. It didn't work. The girl that they used to try to frame me contacted me, said, I need to meet with you. We met. She told me the whole story. I took a signed statement from her. Her name is Pam Fawcett. And I said to Pam, I said, Pam, you're working for these people, the DEA and the FBI and Modesto, by the way. She was making phone calls to me. I said, you're working with these people trying to set me up. Why have you, and of course, in the phone calls, she kept saying, trying to get me to make admissions that had knowledge of a felony. And I wouldn't. I said, I don't have any knowledge of that. Or was involved in a felony, actually. I said, Pam, look, you were working with these people for six months. They gave you $2,000. You had the run of the FBI office. You had your own coffee cup. Why did you come to me and tell me this now? And I'd helped her, give her a little advice about her 14-year-old son in the interim, you know, talking back and forth, as any individual would do who might be able to help. And she said, Ted, I woke up the other morning and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those were her exact words. The FBI not only tried to set me up on a, on a, on a drug deal, They've also, I've also been the victim of four separate investigations. They tried to set me up on a fraud case in Denver, in uh, Dallas. And most recently, very frankly, I've been under surveillance, heavy surveillance. Uh, has, uh, I've had illegal entries into my car, into my apartment. Uh, there's been attempts to gas me uh, within the last month. And I was able to anticipate it and avoid it. But they don't want people like me out telling the truth. And that's what I'm doing. And I will not stop. I will continue to do so in the future. So that's uh, basically it. I brought you from 1776 to the present time. We went through one conspiracy after another. Brian Gimble was interviewing Jim Nichols, uh, Terry Nichols' uh, brother on national TV uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing, by the way. And I had given Jim Nichols my Oklahoma City bombing report. And Jim said to Brian Gumbel, he says, have you read Ted Gunderson's Oklahoma City report? And Gumbel says, oh, Ted Gunderson's a conspiracy theorist. I want you to know I'm not a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy realist. It is there. All you have to do is get your own website, get your own internet, go out. There's a lot of disinformation out there, but you can pick up what's really solid and what's really truthful. And I have done, I have 25 years of research on that back table back there. And if you buy any of my reports or this videotape, or any of my material, I want you to make a promise that you will make copies and distribute it far and wide. We need to wake up America. Right now, let me emphasize again, I'm not anti-American. I don't believe in uh, violence. I believe in change through legal means. But we need to wake up an apathetic sleeping society that is active in America today. And this not only ties into MK Ultra, CIA, it ties into Satanism. There are approximately four million practicing Satanists in America today involved in the Nebraska case. And I can go on about Satanic cults for another hour, but I think my time is almost up. I might mention that speaking of Satanism, there are between 50 and 60,000 human sacrifices, according to three different sources, in this country every year. The satanic cults operate secretly. The satanic cults are, along with our covert criminal enterprise within the government, a serious threat 
to our society. And I thank you very much.